This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here yeah, in South Africa. My name, of course, is Evan Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube right now with our entire show available on demand on our YouTube channel. Now, today, we look at religion in schools here in South Africa. Is there a place for it in a democratic dispensation? In Africa, Islamic militant group Boko Haram continues their reign of terror seemingly unabated in northeast Nigeria. It's also the International Day of Democracy today. We'll talk about that. And finally, planting season is well underway. It's spring after all, and we'll talk to Paul Minari about what you should be doing at home right now. First, Anin Domal has a news update. Good morning, I'm Anindo Mal. Let's have a look at the stories making headlines today. President Jacob Zuma will today embark on another effort to broker a peace deal between Lesotho's warring factions. The political impasse in Lesotho is expected to top the agenda at the SADC summit in Pretoria today. Coalition parties are yet to agree on a date for the reopening of Parliament. Last month's attempted coup saw the military taking over police headquarters in Lesotho prompting Prime Minister Tom Tobani to flee to South Africa. The three parties which form a coalition, the, the leaders will meet and consult and then provide us um, on uh, how they want her to move forward in terms of uh, opening the parliament, but also in terms of addressing the other challenges. And uh, the other thing which is also, which an, is an outcome of uh, where we have reached is that they are also going to be facilitated by a mediator. Classes at the Twine University of Technology in Pretoria will resume on Wednesday. This after they were suspended two weeks ago when students protested over a lack of funds in the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Last week, the Student Representative Council said the strike would continue until they decided to end it. The university says it has taken the decision to reopen to ensure that the academic program resumes as quickly as possible to enable students to successfully complete the academic year. The DA and the ANC have stepped up their campaigning in the Western Cape ahead of the crucial by-elections this Wednesday. Ward 7 in the Bufa municipality became vacant after the resignation of an ANC councillor in July. Since the DA came, they have nothing that they have seen happening, changing in their lives. So one for them is to bring back the ANC. Secondly, this is also a build-up for the 2016 uh, local government elections. U.S. President Barack Obama is expected to detail plans tomorrow to boost his country's involvement in mitigating the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which would involve a greater involvement of the U.S. military in tackling the worst reported outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus. The outbreak has up to date killed about 2,400 people, mostly in Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. Thousands of independent supporters took to the streets of Scotland's largest city, Glasgow, yesterday as polls showed the rival camps running desperately close just a few days before a referendum which could bring the breakup of the United Kingdom. Separatist and unionist leaders worked across the country to woo undecided voters among the millions who will vote on their future this Thursday. Well, those were your top stories today. Kevin, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Annie. Now, the big question we're asking this morning is, is there still a place for religion in our school system here in South Africa? That was the main question raised about two weeks ago when a non-government organization called the Organisatie for Godsdienste Onderrig en Democratie filed an application in the Gauteng High Court seeking to prohibit six public schools from advertising themselves as exclusively Christian or as having a Christian ethos. Predictably, it was an application that sent temperatures rising. It is the first time that a formal legal challenge of this nature has been brought. Now, to tell us more about the reasons behind the application, we are joined by the organization Urgots Chairperson Hans Peterson, who is in our studio in Cape Town. Very good morning to you, Mr. Peterson. Good morning. 
Then we're also joined here in Johannesburg by Kali Krill from civil rights organization Afri Forum, who has offered to fund the legal costs of schools with a Christian ethos, and also by Professor Farid Esak, a professor in the study of Islam and the head of the Department of Religion Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Gentlemen, thank you very much for making time out of your busy schedules to join us for this important uh, conversation this morning. Thank you. I want to go to Cape Town because this is where it all started. Uh, Mr. Peterson, let's start with you. And, and It's a little bit ironic as a, as a, a Christian organization, you opposed this application or you opposed Godsdienst uh, or religion in, in schools. Just give us your position and, and how do you see uh, it play out in the next uh, couple of weeks? I must be clear that we are not against religion in schools. The national policy on religion and our constitution, which we support, allows for religion in schools. What, what we are against is the inculcation of religion into children and the, let's say, reservation of state uh, infrastructure for a specific sectarian view. In other words, in short, certain religious views are being forced onto children. That we are dead against. And then what's the latest then with your court application? Well, we've filed a motion. We have had our uh, gentlemen, esteemed gentlemen, uh, reply that they will oppose the thing. We now wait. There, there's a bit of to and fro in, in terms of documentation. Then the courts will um, give us a court date, which we expect to be early next year. Thank you. Let's come to Johannesburg now. I think uh, it's only right to allow Afri Forum to, to respond to, to this. Uh, you guys have offered to, to pay for the court fees of, of any school with a Christian ethos. Just, uh, just tell us uh, your thinking behind that. Yes, I must firstly, um, I should have said to you that they, they're not a Christian organization, um, and that is their choice. But if you look at their name in the first place, uh, it shows a lack of respect. Uh, for religion, and it's a militant disrespect uh, for, for religion, and that is what we're against. We're in favor of freedom of religion, which means that people have a choice. We believe that the school policy on religion is a good policy. It provides for choice. School governing bodies are democratically elected by parents, and they decide on a religious policy. But within that religious policy, it is also said that nobody would be forced to, to adhere to that policy, people can be excused um, if their is, religion is being practiced. So what we are seeing here at the moment is under the guise of fighting against uh, Christian fundamentalism, what we are seeing from Urgot is that they are fundamentalist in anti-religious because they don't only want to make a choice for their children uh, not to practice the, the religion, they want to force their view onto other parents and children that do make a choice for the Christian, for the Muslim or, or Jewish religion. Um, so we are saying let's have freedom of religion and don't, let's respect one another and don't force uh, children not to practice religion. And that is the fundamentalist view that we are seeing from Urgot. Professor, you are a little bit stuck in the middle here at the moment. Just give us your views on this. I think at the heart of it, Urgot says it's about not forcing religion down children's throats at a young age across the board in schools. Mr. Kali Krill says the opposite. You want the freedom to practice that religion in school. What is your view? Uh, well, first of all, I think that this is a very, very crucial matter that is going to be appearing in our courts. I think it is going to be one of those judgments that will help to shape the very nature of our democracy and the important question about the role of religion uh, in state institutions. The second thing that I want to say is I agree, I agree completely with Kali that on the surface the message uh, from this particular group, um, I'm hesitant to mention their name, the name is on the screen um, <clears throat> or at least uh, on the t-shirt of our colleague in Cape Town. Um, the name of this group is also reflective of the way in which they're going about things um, and the ethos which underpins the organization. It isn't so much a question of the respect for individuals, the question of the freedom of religion, but it does reveal a very deep contempt 
the very fact that they've chosen something which is clearly libelous and deeply hurtful uh, in the eyes of very many Christians uh, is in fact reflective of the strategy with which, the unfortunate strategy with which they had gone about uh, this matter. To get to the point though, I am of the opinion that religious education is the domain of the home, it is the home of the parent. Schools, to the extent that religion can be taught in schools and should be taught in schools, like any other uh, social subject, that should be taught in a purely academic manner, in a critical manner, in an objective manner, and should not be taught from the dimension of any particular religious or any particular sectarian tendency. Certainly not at the cost of a secular state, regardless of whether the taxpayers belong to the majority to a particular denomination or not. We've got some of the views of our viewers, but before we, before we get those views of some of our viewers, we've sent in some questions and some thoughts this morning. I want to get a response from Mr. Peterson. Uh, you've been lambasted here in Johannesburg, sir, for, for being uh, militaristic in your opposition towards religion. What, are you, what do you say to that, sir? That is the de facto response of the religious worldwide, really. If, if, if you can't beat them, then you cry a martyrdom and you, you, you exhibit how you are being oppressed in your country. That is standard, standard fare, um, which, which I find, let's not call it names. What we are against, we, we've said that directly, and what Kali Kriela said there is simply untrue. People are not free to choose. People are being forced. Headmasters of schools are telling children, if you don't like it here, if you don't like a Christian ethos, find yourself another school. Ch children are being taught that if you don't believe in Jesus, you will go to hell. Children are told that if you eat Easter eggs or buy Easter eggs, you will go to hell. So if, if Kali Creel or whoever tells us that children are free to choose, are free to live whatever religion they choose, it's simply untrue. That's a lie. And five years ago, I started this debate. I asked for debates in public. The, the AFRI forum type people were very adamant in, in protecting everybody and saying that they will defend anybody in court because they feel that they are being free and fair in their schools. They are not. Five years has passed. Nothing has happened. Children are still being coerced. Children are still being exposed to evangelism. Children are still not given a free choice. To, to live whoever they want to be. So that is simply not true. And it's for the courts to decide whether we are right or wrong. I want to leave it there. Before you respond, sir, let's just get the views of some of our viewers who are all, as you can understand, all very passionate about this. Weich Malan has a question. Weich Malan says, religion is becoming the new basis for discrimination in South Africa and not only in schools, says Weich Malan. Uh, can I ask you to respond to that and also then to, before we carry on to the next one, uh, uh, Kali, and also then to what you've just heard uh, from our guest, Mr. Peterson, in Cape Town? Well, um, it's actually laughable. I think uh, Mr. Peterson lives in another world. Uh, my children love Easter eggs, so where he comes on that story, I don't really know. The fact is, if Mr. Peterson has a problem with a certain school that they are forcing someone uh, to practice religion, then the school's uh, religious policy is quite clear. He can take on those specific instances. But now they are throwing out the baby with the bathwater um, because they are unhappy about a few instances, which I don't know about. I've spoken to all six of those schools. Um, there is a definite policy that children can be excused if they don't agree with the religion. Um, so we, we must not now, because they have a certain view, now force children um, not to, to practice religion. Um, he's, it's an undemocratic principle to try and impose your worldview. He's saying we are imposing the Christian worldview mm -hmm. on children. He's imposing an anti-Christian, not only an anti-Christian, an anti-religious, an anti-Islamic, an anti-Jewish religion policy on children by saying you are not allowed to practice that. But Mr. And Krell, we must fight it, that is it, is it not a, is a place of religion not in the home and not in school where it can give rise to these kind of conflicts? Uh, well, if you look, I was a teacher myself for, th for three years. A school is more than just an, an, an educational uh, facility. 
children has, has to be formed uh, for, for life after school, and exposure to religion is part of that, but as long as you don't force it onto anybody. And we say don't force religion onto anybody, but we don't want anti-religious uh, fun fundamentalists to force an anti-religious view onto children because there are many parents that want that. Uh, Mr. Peterson is welcome to, to put himself up for election in a school governing body and he can influence the, the religious policy, but there should be no forced religious policy and that is what he's doing at the moment. P Professor, <coughs> if you can respond to that and also then just to the question of our viewer who speaks about religion being a form of discrimination in schools. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that there are larger questions than the one that uh, Mr. Kali Krill is addressing at the moment. It's not so much a question about what is being taught. Is a fundamentalist type of religion being taught? Is a violent form of religion being taught? Are my kids forced to, to eat East, uh, not to eat Easter eggs? I think the larger question is, is a secular school that is funded by a non-denominational state, and that is what we all have in common, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Hindus, is such a state, is it tenable that such a state should be paying taxes or taxpayers' money to fund a particular religious understanding of their faith? Now, of course, Mr. Kalikril comes with the argument and says people can opt out, but opting out implies that the norm is still a religious tendency. And the very opting out is another form of marginalization of some people... We are saying, or at least I am saying, that all students should be treated equally, that the school is a domain of civic education and of scientific education and not of religious formation. It is a domain of social formation. Religion may be a part of that social formation, but only religion as an academic subject, as an objective subject, taught by non-confessional people. You can't have a believer if you have a believer standing in the class and teaching religion, you inevitably end up with preaching, and this is really what is at the heart of the debate. You've got 30 seconds before I'm going to ask for final remarks. We, We're starting to run out of time. We cannot go selectively about the Constitution. The fact is the Constitution sets up a secular state. That you are right. But that very same Constitution in Article or Section 15 provides for that even public schools has a right uh, to accommodate religion and uh, as long as it is fair. And when you allow people not to participate, then that is fair. And then we ask, please don't. If you don't want religion, that's fine. But don't force my children and many other people's children that want religion. Don't force your views onto them. Okay, great. Mr. Peterson, Cape Town, final remarks. If you can give us uh, your views on the entire subject. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we only allocated 15 minutes today. No problem. What I cannot grasp, I cannot grasp this fundamental tienstrijdigheid in what Kali Krill says there. He and his organization takes various companies and government institutions to court for oppressing minority rights. That is one of the strong reasons that Re. Now he's fighting for that exact same right for the oppression of other people's beliefs in his state schools. I just don't grasp it. Thank you very much for your contribution today, Mr. Hans Peterson from the Organisatie for Godsdienste Onderrig in Democracy. We're good. Kali Krell, final remarks, you've got 30 seconds. Well, um, if you listen to what Mr. Peterson says, it seems that he doesn't listen to what I'm saying. I say if people want to be atheists, uh, accommodate them and don't enforce anything on them. We must create mutual recognition and respect amongst religions. And the first step would be not for them to go to court, but to change their name so that they don't infringe on the dignity of believers in this country. Professor? Mr. Creel's position still moves from the assumption that the big thing that unites all of our people is religion, and the uh, concomitant of that must be that atheism or non-Christians must exist as tiny minorities. So you've got the option of being an atheist, but outside the school. You've got an option of being a Buddhist, but outside the school. The school ethos is going to be a Christian. The last thing that I want to say is that we must make a fundamental distinction between the study of religion, which is objective and critical, and religious studies. There is place for the study of religion in our school. There isn't place for religious studies in our schools. 
There we have to leave it today, gentlemen. I wish that we could devote an entire show to it, and I'm sure we will do so in future because it looks like you're going to end up in court, uh, all of you, except you, Professor. Uh, sobering <laughs> thoughts on this Monday morning. Okay. Kali Krill from uh, Afri Forum uh, and also Professor Farid Essak. Professor in the Study of Islam and the Head of the Department of Religion Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Gentlemen, thank you for a lively debate this morning thank and thank you for coming in and, and giving us your views on what is a passionate subject for all South Africans, those that are for it and against it. What are your views? Well, let's take a look at some of your views. Uh, you, we've seen a little bit earlier. Alex Hayes says, as an atheist, worried about our young and impressionable children will be coerced into religious participation at school. That was a point that was raised a little bit earlier. Johan Pace says, at SABC Newsroom, religion has no place in the public sphere. That is why there are churches, mosques, and living rooms in houses. Mr. Kali Krill is not happy with you. Journey to Freedom says, uh, religion in schools should be allowed to strengthen the moral fiber of learners, especially with reported cases of Satanism that we see. Some would argue that Satanism in itself is a religion. At SABC Newsroom from Chanel, my non-believing child is forced to disclose their non-belief if he doesn't attend Bible classes. Why be different and excuse? That is a sobering thought. Nadine Moore says, shouldn't be allowed. We live in a secular uh, society. Superstitions like religion affects children's ability to think critically. And finally, Adrian van der Dissen. None whatsoever, he says, should be taught at home or at a place of worship. And then you asked our producer, Katrin Milan, the question at Mal Katrin, he said, how much religion should be allowed in public schools? Well, it is a question that is going to end up in the court, it seems. And Mr. Kelly Krill has already indicated that they're happy to pay for those schools that are going to uh, take Wilkut, uh, the organization of Mr. Hans Peterson, to court. We'll keep you, we'll keep this conversation going and we'll try and bring these gentlemen back in a week or two as this matter develops here in South Africa. It's a very passionate scenario and we'd love you to contribute and tell us what you think and uh, what you believe should happen in this case. Now we move on to uh, news from around the front pages of the globe. In Europe, the Times is looking at Britain resisting pressure to join the United States in announcing airstrikes against the Islamic State after the militant group reportedly beheaded David Haynes, a British hostage. Then, the International New York Times is looking at Scotland heading to the polls this week and reporting that many feel life won't be the same if the Scots vote to stay in the Union. And in Nigeria, you'll see that the death toll from the collapsed building, the synagogue church of all nations in Lagos, has now risen to 44. And on that story, the raw CCTV security footage showing the synagogue church of all nations in Lagos shortly before its tragic collapse on Friday has been posted on YouTube. Have a look at this. As mentioned, the death toll from the collapse rose to 44 years today, while people trapped in the building that had been rescued have also risen to 139 with varying degrees of injury. Absolutely amazing to see a building simply collapse on itself. Of course, preliminary results are not in, so we can't really speculate as to what happened there. But Watch Newsroom will keep you updated. We'll be back after a short little break.
Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Boko Haram have unleashed a reign of terror and their fighters have completely surrounded the major northeast Nigerian city of Maiduguri. Cameroon claimed to have killed more than 100 Boko Haram fighters. Nigeria's National Emergency Management Agency has estimated that nearly 11,500 fled Gwaza, also in the Borno state, when militants seized the town last month. Boko Haram claims it has since declared Gwaza part of an Islamic Caliphate state. For those of you that uh, don't know, the United Nations Humanitarian Office estimate that 650,000 people have been forced from their homes in the northeastern parts of that country. That's the cities of Yoba and Adamawa. Last month, residents have appealed to the Nigerian government to intervene by sending military reinforcements to the area. But Nigeria's military described a warning from the Borno Elders Forum, an influential regional group made up of retired senior civilian and military officials as alarmist, saying it was clearly intended to cause panic in the city and the nation. Now, Richard Iroanya joins us from the University of Pretoria well, to analyze recent events. A very good morning to you, Richard. Thank you Thank for you joining us. Thank you for having me. It seems as if the Nigerian government has lost complete control in the north, in the northeastern parts of the country. Uh, we see that uh, Boko Haram claims to have almost an independent state in that part of the world. What are your views on it, and is that the case? Uh, well, to, uh, to an extent, uh, uh, that seems to be the case now, because uh, in the northern, in the northeastern part of the country, uh, they've been able to capture some states. And that's because at the beginning, the response uh, of the federal government to the issue was lukewarm. And at the beginning, also the opposition, was, uh, opposition party members were saying that the government uh, was not doing enough you know, to cut Boko Haram insurgency. Uh, but then they were also opposing the tactics of the government. Now, the Nigerian government was, uh, uh, was kind of uh, uh, having a problem on the, the best strategy to adapt you know, in fighting Boko Haram. In the first instance, uh, uh, they tried to use carrot and stick. It was not working very effectively. They used a declared uh, state of emergency. The opposition opposed that. So uh, uh, to, a, to a large extent, one can see that uh, the Nigerian government is beginning to panic uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the militants, uh, 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 insurgent group, have now uh, become emboldened. I know they have been able to declare caliphate with a state of uh, a kind of Islamic state governed yeah. by Islamic laws. Although this is not new to the Nigerian political system, we have, all, we have witnessed you know, things like that in the past. Is there any reluctance uh, on the part of the Nigerian government and military to, to, to protect the people in, in Mayuduri? Uh, we know the, that this area has specific significance to Boko Haram. I think this is where they were founded. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, the Nigerian government uh, you know, has declared total war now, uh, using warplanes, using the helicopter and you know, you know, fighters, and, uh, and a total at war against the Boko Haram insurgent. That tells you uh, the degree of importance that they are attached to the capturing of, uh, of uh, states, and, uh, I mean, I mean uh, 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 smaller cities, you know, just around the uh, uh, Medjugorje and Eastern environs. Um, uh, at the moment, the Boko Haram insurgents want to capture uh, uh, Medjugorje, but that will not be easy. Uh, it will not be easy in the sense that uh, a lot of military movements you know, have not been done, and uh, uh, with Jonathan declaring uh, total war uh, against them. So I do not see them capturing, capturing Medjugorje. I rather foresee them being pushed out of Medjugorje and other cities that they have captured. Now, if they pushed out, what, what are the threats then of insurgency in other parts of Nigeria, in the capital Abuja, uh, the big major centers? And, and also, is there a chance of exporting the violence to other parts of the continent? Of course, uh, uh, if, you, if, if you've been following Boko Haram's development, it started as a, uh, as a local organization, you know, fighting against injustice and corruption in, in, in the Nigerian government, especially in, uh, in Medjugorje, Bruno State. Uh, but now, the way it stands, I do not think that any Nigerian, uh, any Nigerian politician or military officer is completely in charge of Boko Haram. Boko Haram has become hijacked by the international jihadist uh, movement. And we are having fighters coming from, Medjugorje, um, coming from Mali, fighters from Niger, fighters from Chad, fighters from mm. Sudan and Libya, you know, being found in Nigeria, engaging the Nigerian military. And the sophisticated weapon that they are using tells you that they are not being sponsored by any individual in Nigeria. There might be sympathizers among them, 
But then the degree of sponsorship in terms of provision of ammunition, in terms of uh, you know, harboring them in terms of uh, logistic support, I think that has been taken over by international jihadist movement. So the possibility of exporting this crisis to other parts of the, of the continent does exist. Finally, we, we see that it's starting to affect stability yes. within Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's also, Nigeria is now the biggest economy on the continent. Mm -hmm. Economically, what are the threats that Boko Haram is posing to the country that's Nigeria and then maybe the entire ECOWAS bloc? I think economically, uh, uh, Medjugorje is not the, the economic you know, nice where, where it's going to be the center of Nigeria. Now, Nigeria, Nigeria is a monolithic economy, as you very well, uh, as you are aware of. And, uh, and, uh, and that, of course, uh, uh, is in the south, south, south part of the country. And uh, so it is happening so many kilometers away from the economic, uh, you know, minister of the Nigerian economy. So for, uh, as it stands now, it is not impacting the Nigerian economy or global economy assistance. If, for instance, uh, the insurgency in Niger Delta begins, that will hit at the global economy because it will disrupt the supply of oil. And of course, countries that, deploy, that, that depend on the exportation of oil uh, will, will be seriously affected, like South Africa, for example. And so, uh, uh, the way it stands now, it is not impacted on the economy, but it is, it is, it, it does because it does affect the resources of the Nigerian government being expended or being, uh, you know, uh, uh, directed now towards fighting the insurgency. Very concerning indeed. Thank you very much for joining us so uh, from the University of Pretoria, Richard Irohanya, Iro giving his thoughts on what is happening in Nigeria right now. It is, uh, it is a scenario that is affecting, uh, well, the entire western part of the continent, and it looks, well, the threats are legitimate. He says that violence could be exported at some point throughout the rest of the continent. But let's take a look at what you're talking about on social media uh, right now. Derek Watson says... Uh, Beckham. Okay, that's a little bit different. Another millionaire celebrity who doesn't live in Scotland trying to tell us we are better together. Another Scotland is possible, of course. Scotland votes this week. Beckham, millionaire. Carl, millionaire. Rowling, millionaire. Money, millionaire. Scotland for the millions, not the millionaires, they say. Of course, it's a massive vote in Scotland. Will they vote for independence from the United Kingdom? No longer do they want to be Her Majesty's loyal subjects, some of them say. Steve Rich says, instead of Cameron going to Scotland, wouldn't it be easier to put his Scottish supporters in a bus and send them to him? <laughs> That's uh, so some of the views coming in on that matter. Of course, uh, a lot of passion you'll see this week. But let's take a look at what's happening on our news and Facebook page. Today, you will see there that government has approved the support package for power utility ESCOM, which will include the company raising over $4 billion in additional debt and receiving an equity injection from the state as well. You will also see that Western Cape Community Safety Minister Dan Plato will announce details of how he plans to implement recommendations contained in the final report of the Karlicha Commission of Inquiry into policing on the Cape Flats later today. And then National Assembly Speaker Belek Mbete says the motion of no confidence tabled against her by the DA and several opposition parties is a ploy to discredit the ANC. You can find all of those stories and a whole lot more on Newsroom's Facebook page. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more shortly.
Welcome back. You're watching SABC Newsroom. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. President Jacob Zuma will today embark on another effort to broker a peace deal between Lesotho's warring factions. The political impasse in Lesotho is expected to top the agenda at the SADC summit in Pretoria today. Coalition parties are yet to agree on a date for the reopening of Parliament. Last month's attempted coup saw the military taking over police headquarters in Maseru, prompting Prime Minister Tom Sabani to flee South Africa. Classes at the Twana University of Technology in Pretoria will resume on Wednesday. This after they were suspended two weeks ago when students protested over a lack of funds in the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Last week, the Student Representative Council said the strike would continue until they decided to end it. The university says it has taken the decision to reopen to ensure that the academic program resumes as quickly as possible to enable students to successfully complete the academic year. U.S. President Barack Obama is expected to detail plans tomorrow to boost his country's involvement in the migrating the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which would involve a greater involvement of the U.S. military in tackling the worst recorded outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus. The outbreak has to date killed about 2,400 people, mostly in Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone. Well, those are your top stories for today. Evan, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Benin. Now, South Africa has a dual agricultural economy with well-developed commercial farming as well as subsistence-based uh, production in especially the rural areas. The country is divided into a number of farming regions according to climate, natural vegetation, soil type, and then farming practices. Now, Paul Minari is here to shed some light on what we plant, where we plant it, and when we're supposed to plant it. Good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us and, and as always, giving us unique insights into all things uh, Mother Nature, as it were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, Good just, uh, just, just tell us now, springtime, I planted some flowers and some herbs yesterday mm. at my house. Is it the only time of the year that, that, that we can plant? No, actually not. Um, if, you, if you look at our type of climate, uh, you know, we get uh, rains in different times of the year. We get sort of Mediterranean weather in, or climate in the Western Cape province, and then we get uh, subtropical climate here over the high felt and majority of South Africa. And you don't really have to wait for the summer rains to come or the thunderstorms that we have. You can plant right throughout the year, depending on where you are. For garden stuff in, in, your, in the back of your yard, you can use really little water from the yeah. municipality that you can get. You don't really have to rely on rainfall. So we can plant right throughout the year. It's just a matter of how we protect them, especially during really uh, cold times, like in winter, you know, we get a lot of frost up here that could uh, be very damaging to plants and, and vegetables. What do people really, what should people really be looking at planting now, especially let's call it the northern areas of the country mm -hmm. where we're heading into real summer rainfall scenarios. Mm -hmm. What should people be, be looking out uh, to, to planting uh, I've been told uh, the, my dream of planting an avo tree in my, in, my, yeah. in my garden is a pipe dream. Yeah, well, it, it, it's quite strange. I, I used to know a place, uh, Norwood, uh, just north here of, of Johannesburg, is that yeah. there's a lot of avocado trees I've, I've noticed, actually, and, and very big avocados. I can actually give you a street address and, oh. and, and a number where you can find that avo tree. But I, yes. should, I should go there because that's my dream is to have an avocado tree in my... Yeah. In my but it's very difficult. Yeah, uh, the type of soil that we have here is, is quite coarse and the runoff is quite big. So it doesn't keep water a lot and, and the moisture content, although we get a lot of rainfall, but it just doesn't happen. So if you go to Limpopo, there you can plant avos as much as you want. If you go to Mpumalanga as well. But in terms of what you can plant in your garden, I mean, look at things like tomatoes and uh, small pumpkin patches and, and cut flowers, you know, roses and, uh, you know, bulbs. We have a lot of those that, that actually grow up here. In, there, in there are lots of herbs and that sort of stuff that you can put in pots and that you can manicure a little bit. Yes, exactly, with your mushrooms as well. And you'll see a, well, a lot of these wild ones, if you just step out and go to a botanical garden and so forth, mm -hmm. you will see at this time of the year it's actually really beautiful as well. You can maybe uh, buy some of those and plant them in, in your backyard. You just need to take good care of them as well in terms of giving them the right amount of sunlight as well as the right amount of water. Now, South Africa, so let's talk about commercial farming and then subsistence farming, which yeah. is very important in both spheres. Mm. It's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the pillars of our economy, really. Yes. Yes. 
What's the state of, of commercial farming in South Africa and then also subsistence farming? Yeah, it's really big. Commercial farming, you know, is a big drive into our agricultural sector. You know, our agricultural sector is based in crop farming as well as cattle herding and so on. But uh, when you look at the amount of millies we plant and sort of grains that we plant from wheat, you know, barley, lucerne and so on mm. that you find in Otsuar and in, in the Western Cape province that you find in the valleys of uh, the Eastern Cape province as well as a lot of it, a lot of our grain comes... Um, from the Western Cape as well during the winter climate. And it, it's really doing well, but uh, what we've noticed over the last couple of years is that South Africa's economy is starting to advance into more secondary and tertiary sectors, meaning your mining and more office-based, what we do yeah. here. So we're moving away from farming, but it still employs over half a million people across the country, and it's still a very, very huge sector. If you think about the wine farms that we have in the Western Cape province, yeah. In the Western Cape or Cape Town, South Africa is actually the ninth largest wine producing country in the world and it produces quite a lot. There's and the quality of our wines are, are really comparable yes. with the very best in the world. It is exceptional. It is very, very good. I mean, we export so much. People cannot get uh, enough of our sweet wines and our red wines. And it's just fantastic. We produce over 340 million tons of uh, litres, rather, of wine every year. And that rose from, in 1992, we used to produce 22 million to, you know, 3,000 more percent mm. in uh, 2007. It's just Fantastic. In, in these areas, we just had seeing pictures of olives being picked and so forth. Now, I grew mm. up in the traditional wine lens and so forth, but are we seeing uh, these Mediterranean types of crops making their way into South Africa, olives and that sort of thing? Or yes. are we grains? And we, we actually do. If you look at, uh, like, like we said, the Mediterranean uh, climate that we have allows us to have deciduous fruits, you know, your apples and uh, your pears, or all, all, all that stuff that you sort of dream of just about every day. And we are producing those as well, with olives are also coming in, and people are actually branching out into new methods of planting, and technology when it comes to agriculture has grown so far, or so much in the last 20 years or so, that we're actually branching off, and we are getting to produce um, our products even faster and quicker, and they can actually last they much stronger. If you look at the grain that we do, I mean, Millies in Northwest Province, where yeah. it's quite dry and it's hot and there's not a lot of water there, but Millies is starting to survive there, and you're getting these corn heads that are filled up all the way to the to the to the edge of, of a corn head. So that's that's really doing that, well. That's amazing. Now, now before we go, just to give us a little heads up on on, on subsistence farming. Uh, it's mm. obvious, of, often seen as the poor cousin, but it's yeah. becoming more and more important as people move a little bit closer to the land and depend on, yes. on feeding themselves. Yes, in actual fact, subsistence farming is quite big here in South Africa because a lot of farmers farm for themselves and their families. You, you might think it's quite a small practice and something that you know, people do not take very seriously, but it's a very small portion are into commercial farming because of the, the high demands of what the markets are looking for. But people in smaller markets, in places such as Limpopo province in the northwest, as well as in Pumalanga, with the sugar productions, with your evos, your mangoes, and so on, are actually really doing well for themselves and selling into smaller markets as well, not tapping into your big uh, markets that you, know, you probably visit almost every day. And they're really doing good for themselves yeah. in terms of their consumption and what they can also sell off in their communities. So subsistence farming is quite important. It keeps some of our soil arable and, and usable. So, you know, it's not something we can just forget and disregard quickly. Yeah, and, and people want to see the, 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 the smaller farmers do well because it means they get to consume better products at the farmers' markets and that sort of thing. Yeah. But Paul, fantastic as always. Mm. What, a, what an enlightening, what an enlightening experience. Now I suddenly know that I can't plant that ever tree at my house. Paul, <laughs> I'll, I'll go see that man in, in Norwood and see what he's doing. Maybe I should put a warm blanket or a winter <laughs> maybe I should put a winter blanket down and switch it yeah. on maybe that maybe that's yeah. the trick maybe maybe that's what the guy's doing thanks again for joining us as always Paul Minari SABC meteorologist and environmentalist a man that always puts us in the picture so what's happening around us sometimes we can be so unconscious but let's take a look at what's been happening on social media what is happening on social media well this comment is uh, is especially for the Manchester United. Manchester United supporters, Tope Adesipo. Uh, uh, now there's a new sense of belief around Old Trafford. It's a new beginning. Manchester United for life. I couldn't agree with you. Mrs. MUFC says, I love you, I love you so much. I love Manchester United. No, we can't all be perfect. Never pretend, says, dear Manchester United fans, don't go to work putting on your jerseys now. Yes, that, uh, that happens sometimes. And then Gary Lineker, famous English footballer, 
says, I think Manchester United's season has begun. I think that is a scenario that's playing out around the world this morning. Everyone thinks that it is the second coming of the Messiah at the Theatre of Dreams. All of the best, we hope, uh, in, the, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. Now, it's the 15th of September an International Day of Democracy, as resolved by the United Nations General Assembly in 2007. The 2014 theme is Engaging Young People on Democracy. The United Nations has defined democracy as a universal value based on the freely expressed will of the people to determine their own political, economic, social, as well as cultural systems and their full participation in all aspects of their lives. Now, judging by events around the world, Concepts of democracy is still elusive to many nations. And joining us uh, today is a program manager of governance and African peer review mechanism at the South African Institute of International Affairs, Yarik Turiansky, uh, to talk about the advancement of democracy in our lifetime. Good morning, uh, Yarik. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. I'd be very happy to speak about Manchester United, but equally happy to <laughs> chat about democracy today as well. Uh, everybody wants to talk about it. You know, it's <laughs> like having a brother in prison sometimes. Uh, you still love him, but you don't talk about him. And, you know, having the first victory, no. I think that was great. But let's talk about democracy, because that's what, uh, <clears throat> what it's about. It's the International Day of Democracy today. Is democracy... Uh, uh, something that uh, that's losing a bit of luster around the world as we as we see an increase in in militaristic beliefs you know what i've always found democracy to be a very interesting term because it's taken for granted i think by the majority of people around the world yet it's very hard to find a precise definition of what democracy is and once we start going into democratic institutions then we can have long long lists that people might not necessarily agree and uh, you know, if we look at a country, for example, like the, like the United States, and if we look at a country like Russia, both will claim to be democracies, yet the way that democracy uh, takes place within those two countries would be very different. Yeah, just, just, just tell us about that, because, you know, we saw the George Bush second election play mm -hmm. out in 2008, I think. It was, it was slightly concerning, the, the, the final count, as it were, mm -hmm. there. And, and, and then juxtapose that with Russia, where you have a real strong arm mm -hmm. scenario playing out. Uh, how does that play out, and how does that affect the world, then? You know what, I think that if we go back to the historical roots of democracy, specifically ancient Greece, where most of the people believe it has originated, the term democracy is divided into demos and kratos, rule of the people. But if we look at the way that uh, democracy was taking place in ancient Greece, it excluded the female population and it also excluded slaves. So it was a very elitist way of democracy where yeah. only the men were, were allowed to, to vote and then to rule. Now, the question is, how different is it in the modern world? We have uh, regular elections in, uh, in most countries, whether that's, uh, whether that's Russia or whether that's uh, Zimbabwe or whether that's the U.S. Or, or whether that's Sweden. But that's pretty much where the rule of the people ends. So your only contribution to democracy is going to the ballot every four to five to sometimes seven yeah. years, ticking the box for your candidate, and uh, then you lose any sort of... Uh, a meaningful participation in the way that the, that the country is being run. Now, democracy in today's world, in 21st century world, is almost directly linked with capitalism. Is, mm. that, is that right? And is that sustainable? I think that's more the, the notion of, uh, of your Western liberal democracy and providing equal opportunities for all, which is the same thing that, uh, that capitalism does. And I think that this is where we're going to be moving towards in the next few decades. Right now, the debate is much more about governance rather than democracy, because governance is setting up rules that will benefit people equally. It's your, it's your rule of the law. It's your equal economic um, opportunities, it's being able to express your, yourself, whether through your religion or through your opinions or uh, freedom of association. So it's going to be a much broader concept uh, in, the, in the coming decades, but uh, of course much depends on, on your background. Um, even though the opportunities might be similar or, or more or less equal for all, whether you were born with money to begin with uh, has a lot to do with your advancement in the capitalist world and, for example, the ability to run for office and the costs that yeah. uh, are associated with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Democracy, uh, it, uh, it's a very expensive practice, one would think. Now, tell us about Africa and, mm. and the experience. We've just seen in Lesotho here, mm. uh, in, in, in Southern Africa, a scenario play out. Is democracy under threat constantly in South Africa, in Africa, a wider Africa? And, and does Africa need democracy? You know what? I think it's difficult to speak about Africa as a, as a unified whole. Um, taking into account the, the difference between the, the different regions in Africa, even at your basic, your sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and your North Africa, but also the different uh, economic communities we have uh, at this point in time, such as SADC, uh, such as ECOWAS, the way that they deal with these crises. Mm. Um, certainly in Lesotho, we were there a few years ago, uh, my colleagues and I, when we were conducting research, and um, we were commending them on the conduct of their previous elections uh, in, uh, in 2012, because it was one of the first times when we saw a change of government and um, uh, there was no violence associated with it, as uh, happened twice in the country in the previous two decades. Yeah. But clearly there was some unsatisfaction, some, some feelings, and it's all about finding ways and, uh, and mechanisms uh, to resolve these. So South Africa seems to be taking the lead, and I think that's very important um, in Africa, particularly dealing uh, through sometimes your neighbors, like Lesotho yeah. is with South Africa. But also if we look at the example of, for example, Mali and how the regional economic community, ECOWAS, immediately got involved there yeah. uh, to try to get the differing parties uh, to sit down and to talk and find a way forward out of the crisis. The African Renaissance is upon us and we've got a lot to, to thank Nelson Mandela for. Thank you very much for joining us. Yarik Turiansky uh, from the Inter Institute of International Affairs. Thank you again for joining us today. That's where we wrap it today. It's International Day of Democracy. Do your bit uh, to not infringe on the rights of others. We are all free, we would like to think. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. The show then repeats at 2 in the afternoon with a complete rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning. Don't forget we also stream live on YouTube at that time with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning.